Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Carolyn Reynolds, and I am absolutely thrilled and delighted uh, because um, I've managed to persuade um, Sally Wainwright to join me today. And um, I know she's really, 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 really busy, and and we've only got to, we've only got an hour with her. We've had an awful lot to cover in this hour, but I'm determined that at the end of it, um, hopefully. Sally and I are helping you get a sense of what life is like in drama today, but also as it was, how it's changed, and also what it's like to get to the point where you are a multi-award winning um, writer, exec producer, and director. Before we get into a list of Sally's achievements, though, she is most well known as a writer. And people tend to forget that quite recently, She's taken on the mantle of directing, and boy, is she directing. So I'd actually like to start with a clip, if you don't mind, which is a clip from Happy Valley. to wipe your ass for you. Oh, yes. You like that, you slag? show that first because it is just a stunning stunning sequence and actually when you think that that is coming from somebody who's known as a writer that they've managed to direct that and to that level is stunning I want to rattle off some titles here please forgive me this I will I'll go as fast as I can because we've got a lot to, to achieve but just listen to this list work that Sally has written created written for directed exec produced Families, Children's Ward, Emmerdale, House of Windsor, Revelations, Coronation Street, Bad Girls, Playing in Playing the Field, Spark House, At Home of the Braithwaite, Canterbury Tales, Wife of Bath, Shakespeare Retold, Taming of the Shrew, Jane Hall, The Amazing Mrs. Pritchard, Dead Clever, Life and Crimes of Julie Bottomley, Bonkers, Unforgiven, The Last Witch, The Last Tango in Halifax, Happy Valley, which she also directed, Scott and Bailey, and To Walk Invisible, which is her latest on the Bronte sisters and brother. Wow. <laughs> Um, we're going to go back to Happy Valley in a minute, um, Sally, but I just want to start by going right back to the very beginning. You were driving a bus. Yeah. Tell us a bit about getting into the industry. Um, the, the first 
time I, um, when I was at university, I wrote a stage play, which I took to the Edinburgh Festival. And I, um, at university, I'd started to make contacts in the TV industry. Um, Tony Dinner, who ran the BBC script unit, and Mark, George Mark Stein, who worked at Thames Television. So I had a few contacts, and I invited people to come and see the stage play that I'd done. And nobody could come. <laughs> Um, but what I'd written to an agent, um, I'd, somebody had given me a list of agents and I'd written to them all. And none of them turned up. But Meg Davis, who worked at MBA then, couldn't come. But she asked to see the script. So I sent her the script. And she, she took me on on the strength of the script. And so um, I went to live in London, because I, I think I was advised that you had to live in London if you wanted to be a writer which may have been true then, I'm not sure it's true now. Um, and then, yes, I drove buses for 18 months when I'd gone, because I had to make money. And um, then after <clears throat> that amount of time, Meg got me a chance to write a trial script for The Archers for BBC Radio 4. And I resigned on the strength of <laughs> writing a trial script, because I was so, uh, I don't know what it was, stupidity or arrogance. Or just fed up of driving fucking buses. <laughs> um, but I, I, I gave up my job because I, I was determined this trial script was going to work, and it did. It's interesting that right at the beginning, there's that determination to kind of crack it. Um, I, think, I think I've always... I always had an innate sense that it was going to work, that it was going to work out. You, you then got into it because kind of archers... Um, yes, I then got headhunted. <laughs> God, by Emmerdale. And um, I wrote six episodes of Emmerdale and then I got sacked. Um, I, I, did... I think you referred to them as joyless freaks at the time, if I remember rightly. No, I think I said that more recently. I, didn't, okay. I, did, I think that wasn't why I got sacked. I got sacked because, <laughs> um, well, I was resigning. And this act of it, so perhaps it was <laughs> mutually beneficial. <laughs> um, no, I did an interview in The Observer. It was called Experts, uh -huh. Experts. Do you remember? Yeah, I do. I and... Do. Um, <laughs> They, every week they asked people from a given profession who their mm. most admired person was who did the same job. And I talked about John Stevenson. You did. And from and I, a writer on Coronation Street, yeah. Rather ineptly compared Emmerdale rather unfavourably to Coronation Street. Why wouldn't you? And um, yes, they didn't like that. But it, I, it wasn't a good show to work on Emmerdale. I, I'm sure it's fine now. But uh, that, at the time, it, all the scripts were rewritten by the script editors. It was a, and, a, it's yeah. an interesting sort of team writing exercise about the sort of different shows having different yeah. priorities, and you got you didn't have as much script editing done on Coronation Street. Well, you didn't, didn't need it. Well, well, and certainly the script editors didn't rewrite the script. But my I mean, that's why everybody wanted to write Corey. I, was can, I can remember producing um, Coronation Street when and Sally was writing it, and. Uh, you were reluctant to talk in those days as a team, weren't you? There were some very dominant characters around the table. Oh, I didn't speak for the first three years. And you, you, you kept saying every meeting, you would say to me, this is the one I'm going to... I know. Going to. Well, I got very upset because I felt inadequate. I didn't know why you employed me, except the scripts were good, I suppose. The scripts were extremely good. <laughs> but there was, a, there, was a, there was a wonderful day when um, I thought, oh, Sally's going to have to talk. She's going to say something, what if she's going to kind of... And... Uh, for after a few, meeting, a few meetings, I would actually say, did you say something, Sally? Or something like that, and you'd go, hmm? <laughs> and then this particular day, she went, yep. And we all kind of went, what, what? <laughs> and, uh, and, and you said, yeah, I've got this new family, they're called the Battersby's. And, and then, yeah, I think they're still yeah. in. So yeah, it kind of says at all, doesn't it? But it was, it was a hard environment. I mean, um, obviously you were very tough, tougher than me. But it was very male-dominated, mm. and it was, in those days, uh, at lunchtime, everybody used to get pissed, and then in the afternoon, it was a bloodbath, mm. wasn't it? And it was met a, a lot of uh, very confident older men who'd been there a long, long time. So it's quite a hard environment to, to come in on yes. as you know, a 30-year-old woman and uh, feel confident about 
And bizarrely, these Speaking. men were writing for a matriarchal, you know, society. It was a very strong female characters, which was strange. But, but you, if you look back, would you say now? Well, things women are... have historically always been written by men on yeah. television. So, so, so would you say the now last things are better? Years. Things are different. God, yeah, massively. Women are writing for women. Yeah. Rather than, I mean, even Corrie, you know, bless Tony Warren. Uh, you know, Corrie was celebrated for its strong female characters, but they were, even those were being written by a man originally in the 1960s. I mean, I think I was only the third woman who wrote Coronation Street. It was Adele Trier. There were, Kay wrote one episode. Yeah, there were a few that wrote one episode, and then they sort of went, ooh, I'm out of here. So, um, yes, but uh, I, think, I think team writing is... It requires different strengths in a way yeah. because you've kind of got to leave your ego out the door and mm. throw everything in the pot and not every writer is 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 used to that or can cope with it mm. but you then um again we worked together on at home with the braithwaite's because that was the start really of you doing your own that thing. was the first original drama but that, that was originally written in, in a, for a sort of more comedy it was first commissioned as a half hour sitcom that's right. And can you remember uh, how that, because it was turned down, wasn't it? You were trying to get your own work away. Um, no, I think well, the, the, my memory of it is that Tony Wood commissioned his half hour right. sitcom. Yeah. Then Tony left and you inherited it and yeah. you recommissioned it as an hour long drama. Yeah. Well, oh, well dr yeah. comedy drama. Yeah. Should we, should we have a look at what probably may feel a bit dated now, but in its time had quite it an unusual style of direction. I've no idea, I don't know. <laughs> so long since we've seen this. At home with the Braithwaite's. Let's have a little clip. Happy birthday. Oh, thank you. Mm. Cigarettes? No, open it. Lottery ticket. Thank you. Mm, if you win, I want half. With nothing bigger than what to buy next. Oh dear. The whole concept is irresponsible. The whole concept is based on greed. But what's wrong with greed? Well, yes, we can get into that if you really greed want. Greed is the to. mother of invention. Necessity. What? Necessity is the mother of invention. It boils down to the same thing. It most certainly does not. Anyway, get out of the point I was making earlier. I wouldn't bother, pal, because nobody's listening. That doesn't make me wrong. Pal. You got quite heated. Actually, it became rather unpleasant. Chaucer. Oh! And it made me think that, that if I ever did win, if I wasn't careful, it might cause more harm than good. You must be very restrained. Yes, I can be. You see, I'm very lucky with my family. We have our problems, of course. David's always worried about work. And Virginia, I sometimes worry that she's not happy at university. She won't look at you twice. Piss off. And Sarah takes everything so very seriously. I told her. I warned her. I said, don't invite them. And Charlotte's at that awkward age. But I love her. I love them all. And we're so well off. We are, really. We've got everything we need and a little bit more besides. If suddenly there was more, a lot more, I think it could spoil them. To change their ambitions, their aspirations, their whole outlook on life. And I couldn't help thinking it'd be for the worse. Is everybody gone? Virginia? Mm. Tamsin sleeping in your room. No. She left without you telling me. I'm supposed to get back to York now. What did you do that for? I don't know. Are you watching this film? No. 
What are you after? Lottery results. One, two, three. Would you like one? Was, this was the start of you finding your own voice yep. and and style of writing mm. and uh, when you look back do you think things have changed a lot in terms of trying to sell shows then and now would you say um i i don't think so i mean i think that whenever i have to go and pitch a show i think i'm just I'm just very honest. I don't try and um, pitch what I think they want. I think I pitch what I want. It was your... So, and that seems to have worked. And looking back then, of course, this was all about somebody winning a huge amount of money on the lottery. The lottery mm. hadn't been going that long, had it? So this was a kind of... Um, you're trying to find... I was trying to think what was inspiring the original idea of Braithwaite. It was sort of because this was your original idea. Yeah, it? well, the original idea, I don't know if you remember, but... Um, I think the lottery had come out, but I, I was trying to think of a clever way of getting money without without it actually being the lottery. Yeah. And the original idea was that she got a, um, a bill from British Telecom, and it, it wasn't it. a bill, it was a credit note for 38 million. And she tried to ring BC up to say, I think you've credited my account with a lot of money, and of course she couldn't get through to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> That's so she gave not changed, up. yeah. But we decided... I can't remember why, why we decided. Was it ITV? They wanted, they wanted it to be the lottery because mm. I think it coincided with Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, the first yeah. night of Who Wants yeah. to Be a Millionaire. Yeah. So it, it um, became a bit of an event on, yeah. for the first episode going out with the first episode of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, which was just fortuitous. This was the first time, of course, that you've got more closely involved on your own show that other people are now directing. Mm. How did you find that? Well, I, I always found it difficult um, having other people. I mean, I worked very closely with Robin. I was going to say, Robin Shepherd was the first Who directed director. that clip that you've just seen. But then you had, we had to sort of, as more series came on board, more directors came on board. Um, yeah. I, I suppose I'd always been really interested in production. Uh, and some writers aren't. Some writers are just happy to do the job and walk away and leave it to other people. And I never, I never was, because I was always fascinated by the production side of it. And so I used to find it frustrating, as you know, I used to find it very frustrating when uh, directors got things wrong, as they invariably do, because, you know, with the best will in the world, you put what you can on the page and you expect them to follow it, and they do. But there's always room for misunderstandings or misinter uh, and other interpretations of your work. Um, do you think a writer's got to, um, if not directing... Have, has to have a really, really, really close relationship with that director so that you feel they're on the same page as you, if you know what I mean. Do you think there's enough prep to sort of say, um, I th this I think, is what I want? I don't know if writers... Are, at the, when we did the first series, I was surprised by the extent to which I wasn't consulted as a writer. Uh, you know, if I, was, if, I'm direct, if I was directing somebody else's work, my first resource would be the writer for information about the script. And I was amazed that that didn't happen as a matter of course. And as a writer, you had to push your way in and say, hang on a minute, you, if you're making decisions about how it's going to be shot, you need to talk to me. Mm. And what about actors? If actors are saying, oh, I've got this, this script, I want to change this mm. word or this sentence. Yeah. Well, one of, the, one of the things I have learned over the years, and I, I, be, I thoroughly believe this now, I didn't know whether it was actors flattering me or... <laughs> Not, but now I thoroughly believe it. Actors always seem to love having the, director, the writer around because if they're... In rehearsals and production. Well, anywhere. Yeah. They're always pleased to see the writer. Uh, that's my experience because if they have a problem with a line or they don't know how to say a line or anything, they know that the best person to ask is the writer. Mm. Um, so I, 
you know, I, th I think it's, uh, it, it really surprised me on the first series of Breathworks how much I wasn't mm. consulted and I was kind of pre presented with the first episode when it had all been shot. I didn't I, even get the rushes. I think you were actually, I think you were actually breastfeeding when we had the first read through. Actually, yeah. you were sitting in the corner on the floor. Yeah. Which so that sort of, what does that say really about sort of working mums and, but yeah. yeah. Okay. Again, again, building on your own voice and 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 getting a sense now of more. And we're having to because we can't show clips for everything. And I want to have a question and answer session near the end, so for everybody to be able to ask their own questions. We speed on then to last tango because mm. that's the next one I'd like to show. But before we see a clip, this was one. It, it, how often are you drawing on your own experiences when you're coming up with ideas? I think all the time. I mean, Last Tango is an unusual example because it was literally what happened to my mum, that she met um, Alec, who she'd been at school with, and they hadn't seen one another for 60 years, and then they got back in touch on, um, I think it was uh, Friends Reunited. Uh, in the show, we turned it into Facebook, but it, uh, the real story was Friends Reunited. And it, and it was literally what happened that they... They fell in love with each other at the age of, I think they were both 75. And they'd been in the same class at school. In, in Last Tango, um, Alan and Celia had been in love with each other when they were 16. In real life, Alec had been in love with my mum, but my mum couldn't quite remember who he was. <laughs> so I changed that to make it a bit more romantic, that they'd both had had a relationship, um, a crush on each other. And for whatever reason, they'd, uh, he, you know, they'd got split up when he moved away from the area. Um, but I think ev everything comes from within. Every that was a, a literal, you know, stealing yeah. from your own experience, your own life. But um, people, so, people often ask me where your characters come from. They all come from in here. Even when I've based a character on someone else, uh, you know, sometimes I base characters very hugely on one person. Um, sometimes I use steel bits from here, there and everywhere of mm. people you know. But then a big chunk of it is yourself. It's, it comes from within. It comes from aspects of your own life, inevitably. And when you were selling like, the idea, selling yeah. the, the... This is sort of two older characters as the central mm. characters in it. Did, did broadcasters want to buy it? No. Um, ITV and BBC both turned it down. Did ITV and BBC both turned down Scott and Bailey as well, originally. Um... So, yes, it got turned down by the BBC and ITV. We didn't go to Channel 4 with it because we just didn't think it was Channel 4 material. Mm. And we, me and Nicola thought it... Um, Nicola Schindler, who I work with at Red, um, we just thought it was dead and gone and we needed to move on to the next thing. And then Danny Cohen became um, controller of BBC One. And he consciously was looking for programmes that would appeal to... Um, the bulk, the, the majority of the BBC One audience, which is people over 50. And he, he, he greenlit it like that. It greenlit it overnight after we thought it, six months, you know, we thought it had been, was dead, basically. Let's, let's have a look at it. If you're insisting on a Saturday slot, you're looking at four, five months away. I think sooner rather than later. Mm. Are either of you divorced? No. No, no. Widowed. And you're both regular churchgoers, obviously. Well, we have been in the past. Hmm. So you're not regular churchgoers now? Not... no. When did you last go to church? Christmas? 1977. What about you, Mrs Dawson? About the same. Mm. So, why do you want God's blessing if you don't go to church? I'm just interested. We thought he might like the trade. <laughs> <laughs> Miserable. <laughs> <laughs> 
bitch. <laughs> I mean, they're wonderful. Don't go. <sighs> well, we could live <laughs> up at Brush. Ah, but then you wouldn't be Mrs. Buttershaw. No. And I fancy having a do. I want to buy a hat. Oh, we could find another vicar. I bet they're not all like that. Nah, she's put me off. That's it. Now with me in the church. End of good night, Vienna. I have left the building. <laughs> well, where would you like to get wet? Because, I mean, you can get wet anywhere now, you know. Oh, somewhere classy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. South Aurum Hall. South Aurum Hall. Oh, I used to love South Aurum Hall. Is it still there? Yeah, yeah, as far as I know. They've not mugged it up? No, I think it's just as creepy as it ever were. <laughs> Humour plays a huge <laughs> part in yeah. all of your writing, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, is that consciously you've gone down that road, or...? I like to make people laugh. Um, but I also think it's really important humour. I think it's a really important uh, tool of communication. I think, you know, even Happy Valley, which is very dark, it's, it's also... I mean, that's why I wanted Sarah to play Catherine, because she can do the dark stuff with knobs on, but she could, she's also got... She's mm. incredibly funny, mm. so she can really get the humour across. Um, and I think that's important, even in something as dark as Happy Valley, to be funny, because I think it's very human. I think we all um, try and make each other laugh if we can. I think people resort to that all the time in everyday course of conversation. Most people, if you can say something in a funny way, rather than in, not in a funny way, most people would choose to be funny because it um, engages people, it attracts people. Uh, it, 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 it's a really useful tool of communication. So for me, it's about being real, it's about being authentic. So I do, I do like writing comedy, I, I love making people laugh, but I also think it's, it's, it's true and, and authentic about people. If people are um, setting on the road to becoming a writer themselves, mm. do you have tips for them in terms of how you write, where you write? Do you, do you have to lock yourself away in a spare bedroom? Do you hire yourself an office space? Do you, you know, kind of how how do you how do you discipline yourself? Because you, you especially when you've got you know um, directors pressing for the latest draft of something whilst you're still trying to create this new idea, or mm. how do you balance and discipline yourself? I don't think I, <clears throat> I do. I think I'm a workaholic, so I tend to work. Whenever I can, you know, even coming up to London today on the train, I'm thinking about when can I get some work in. I can work on the train. If I get there a bit early, I can sit in a coffee shop and work. Um, you know, I just my brain just revert. It's probably not very healthy, but it's it's. I, I think it's um, it, it's because I, my hobby is writing, so um, I tend to work. You know, your brain never really switches off. And would you? But I remember the first job I did when I wrote The Archers. Yeah. I was. I just took it terribly seriously, and I used to get up at five o'clock every morning and 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 work then. And I, and now I get up at two two o'clock in the morning and work. <laughs> and because I can, you know, we all know this. You can work at night. There's no, there are no distractions for some reason. If you get if you can work between two and seven in the morning, you will get a lot more done than if you're trying to work between two and seven in the afternoon. So. And would you sort of? Do a really detailed outline first? Yes. Or, right. I mean, the older I've got, the more experienced I've got, the more I think that's invaluable to do a really detailed scene breakdown. I've, the, the script I'm working on at the moment, mm. I wrote um, an 11-page scene breakdown in, like, font 9, <laughs> size 9. So it's a very intensely detailed document and I think and I'll, it'll take me about a week to do that and that's sort of almost everything apart from the dialogue yes right. and I think that's half the battle yeah I think once once you've done that that's the hard work and then you can enjoy writing the dialogue yeah I mean there's still there's still a battle with the dialogue sometimes but I think it's much more likely to flow if yeah. you've, you've you've just got a really detailed blueprint yeah you're known for strong female characters 
Mm. Um, I think sometimes unfairly, because I actually think you're right just as well for other. But anyway, but yeah. but the sort of strong female roles I are think I really prominent. To focus on the women. Yeah. So I hope my ca male characters are just as detailed. It's yeah. just that I tend to uh, foreground the women. Yeah. More. Let's have a look at Scott and Bailey, because this is, and then uh, when we, we'll have a look at the clip, and then maybe you can give us a little bit of background on um, why you write for certain characters, but also dealing with crime and the whole process of that, what you have to do to yep. research that. Okay, let's have a little look at Scott. Right, lads, story so far. Where's Janet and uh, Rachel? Delivering the death message. I squared it with West Yorkshire because the body's with us. Susan Metcalf, 43. Wife, mother, primary school teacher, living over the border in Rippenden, West Yorkshire. Battered senseless, she was found in the boot of her own car in a lay-by off Saddleworth Mall 440 this morning. Caught in couple out on a late one, saw blood on the boot, called three nines. Ambulance arrives just after five. She's still breathing. Indications suggest she's likely to prove fatal. She dies 6.17 this morning at the Royal Oldham. Casualty consultant said it looked as if somebody tried to eviscerate her. Do what? Pull her insides out. Massive internal injuries. She'd been raped every which way from Christmas. Are you listening? Mm. Susan had been to the theatre in Oldham with her friend, Carol Manning. Susan rang Carol at 11pm saying she can't work out where she's parked her car because she's not familiar with the town. She describes being near Cam Cabs on Rishworth Road. Carol directs Susan back to Buick Road. Susan had remembered the name of the street that she parked in. That's the last anyone heard from her. Family reports are missing in the early hours. Night crew talked to Carol, the friend. They're straight onto the CCTV outside the taxi office. OK, here's a bit which shows her being followed by some lad, man, boy, bloke, who just left the taxi place. He follows her. Look at him. Heat-seeking missile. He follows her towards Buick Road. We've got him on three separate cameras, still behind our victim. Six minutes later, her vehicle seen driving away from Buick Road, but those are not her hands on that steering wheel. Look at that watch. So the chances are she's already in the boot by that stage. The good news is we think we know roughly where he lives. Taxi operator says that he asked for a cab to the Walden estate. There's none available. So he comes out and that's where he bumps into her, jangling her car keys, looking lost. Are you all right? Just pull him. So lots of nice fast track actions waiting for you on this one. Andy's coordinating the house to house. Something tells me this isn't this particular little weirdo's first outing, but let's make it his last. Finish your brews, get your gear and go. I want us giving this boy an early morning knock. Late night. Pregnant. Um, this was a new field for you, really. Which yeah, I kind of prided of myself on never having written a cop show. And then the so what happened? <laughs> well, um, it was Saran. It was Saran wanted to be Cagney and Lacey in Manchester. Um, so Nicola asked me to write the script, and then completely fortuitously, I'd met Diane Taylor, who was a detective inspector with. Greater Manchester Police major incident team. So she, she'd also worked for um, an organisation called The Faculty. I think they call it something else now. But it was, um, she, she was a very, very experienced uh, murder detective. I mean, she spent a life solving murders. And she was a fascinating woman. I met her socially. Mm. And it was just fortuitous that I met her at the, around about the same time that uh, Nicola and Saran uh, asked me to do this. And... What, was, what really interested me was that she talked about murder and how murder teams work in a way that I felt I'd never seen on television, ever. And I think, looking back, it was because so many of our cop dramas, people don't actually do any research. They just base it on American cop shows that they've seen. So they tend to use the American model of police work 
rather than the British model. Mm. So, uh, you know, nobody, no, nobody ever goes out in twos solving murders. You don't interview people on the streets. That's just not how it works. Mm. An interview conducted on the street with two detectives would not be legal. <laughs> you know, you have to do it in a room with a lawyer. You have to record it. It has to be very well documented. Uh, interviews aren't spontaneous. Interviews, Diane used to talk about how an interview, a really well-conducted interview is as well prepared as a, a ballet, it's choreographed. You anticipate all the answers you're gonna get. Um, so she, she, she told me extraordinary things that I never, I had no idea, or everything she told me sounded so unlike anything I'd ever seen on television. So there's a lot so, of research, obviously. Huge amount of research. Uh, and it, it was invaluable, it was extraordinary. What, um, just, and we became really good friends. We um, used to spend an extraordinary amount of time together. So she'd tell me all these wonderful, she'd give me these wonderful insights into how the police really works. But also just hearing her speak, I mean, some of Amelia's lines there, that's pure Diane. Uh, you know, the kind of um, little mannerisms of speech that, that are peculiar to the police. Um, I can't, I'm, I'm trying to think of, I think it was Leslie's line, actually, where she said she'd been raped every witch whisk mm. from Christmas. Mm. You know, I'd never heard that expression before. Mm. So the, the, it's peppered with yeah. just what you draw the, on. the way Diane spoke. So, again, moving on, mm. uh, which brings us actually to recap on that Happy Valley clip that we saw earlier. You, you, you're now wanting to direct your own material. I always had one. You always wanted to. And, and I think, you know, it was a, a combination of having children and not and, and finding the confidence to do it mm. and finally yeah I now that that led to obviously because that particular scene for example is is quite a violent scene mm. that a broadcaster will have an opinion in terms of okay this is going out at what time to what audience mm. how do you find that dialogue with broadcasters on material you've cut um they're usually very hands-off at the BBC. Um, again, it's just having a good relationship that's built up over many, many years. Yeah. The, f the, the, the fight that you saw at the beginning um, was originally about twice as long. And Charlotte Moore, who's the controller of channels at the BBC, um, asked us to cut it down hugely because she was worried about the content being too explicit. Um, and I really fought uh, and sulked to try and keep it. But uh, she was insistent that we had to cut it down. And she was right in the, at the end. In the end, I think it has just as much impact as the original longer version. And, and things like sound? Um... Well, that's one of the massive things I learned when I directed how important sound is. Um, that clip that you saw at the beginning, had it gone on, um, the Catherine presses her SOS button on her radio and there's this really chilling beep that we already, as, as by that episode, uh, an, uh, another police officer being killed and we associate that beep with when a police officer is in real mortal danger. And it ended there, instead of having the um, title music on the end, it just played out with the beep and it was really chilling. And we, I hadn't planned that when I wrote it, that came out in the dub. I had this fantastic sound editor, Mark. And um, it, it was a really exciting learning curve for me about how much you can achieve with sound. So now established director, as well as exec producer and writer, our last clip today is from Talk Invisible. Do you want to talk a bit about that show? Because this yeah, hasn't gone um, out yet, but you're seeing a clip today. This is a two hour uh, TV film that's going out uh, at Christmas. Um, which I wrote and directed. Um, it, it, it's about the Bronte sisters. And um, the, the BBC asked me about five years ago to write something to um, commemorate uh, the bicentenary of Charlotte Bronte's birth. So I, I, I decided to write about the last three years when the, the Bronte sisters were all alive. Um, I don't know if you know anything about them, but Branwell Bronte and then Emily Bronte and Anne died in quite quick succession of one another from tuberculosis. Um, so I, I've written about the last three years when uh, the sisters decide, they've always written since childhood, 
but it was, it was then considered vulgar for women to publish uh, novels. And so they had to make this decision about whether they would try and make money from what was that, you know, their mm. passion. And um, Charlotte Bronte was very ambitious and definitely wanted to publish, whereas Emily Bronte was, she only really wrote for herself. And if it hadn't been for Charlotte, we would probably never have, never have seen, not just Wuthering Heights, but Emily Bronte's extraordinary poetry, which I don't know if, you know, she, she should be as famous for her poetry as she is for Wuthering Heights. Um, but so it was at a time when women, it was, as I say, it was considered vulgar. Charlotte wrote to the poet laureate Southey for advice. And he, he wrote back to her saying, literature cannot be the business of a woman's life. Um, so she obviously didn't heed that. Oh, thank God. <laughs> um, so, and and one, of the, uh, one of the important things for me was to root the Bronte family very firmly in Yorkshire. Because I think people... Um, in the past, so I haven't done that. You know, the, there was a BBC drama on in the, in the 1970s about the Bronte family, and they all spoke in RP accents, mm. which I found really weird and offensive. Mm. It was like saying that the poets, therefore, they can't possibly f be from the north. You know, um, so that was important for me to make it feel very grounded in the north. I also wanted to get away from what I think of as typical BBC dressing up box dramas where, where it's all a bit chocolate boxy and everybody's got white teeth so I made them I've, I've got all the teeth nice and brown and, uh, and I, I just wanted it to feel real you know I wanted it to feel uh, that it was an age where things weren't disposable everything mm. was make do and mend people didn't have mobile phones because um, I, I often feel when I watch a lot of period dramas these days they look so slick and clean and sanitised yeah. and it wouldn't feel weird if somebody did get out a mobile phone so I wanted it to fit. I wanted this to feel really grounded. And okay, let's let's take a look. Yep. What's the matter? What's the matter? Somebody has been in my room. Somebody. Somebody has been through my things and not had the wit when they put them back to realise that everything's in a certain order. Well, who we have and I have. You haven't. You wouldn't. I know that. Branwell's in Halifax. It's safe to assume Papa couldn't see to do it. And anyway, why would he bother? Tabby's got better things to do and Martha can't read that well. Yet she also has too much dignity and respect for other people's things. I shouldn't have. I know. But I'm not sorry. I mean, I am sorry. Look. Emily, your poems are, they're extraordinary. I know they're private, I know they're personal, there are a thousand and one things, but they're not something to keep hidden. I, I admit, it's curiosity, but not idle curiosity, I hope, but something more noble. Noble? Going into people's bedrooms, going through people's things? No woman, no one has ever written poetry like this. Nothing I've read, nothing I can think of, nothing published as its equal. Emily, they're exceptional, they're astonishing. I, I couldn't breathe when I was reading them. I know you're angry, and I know what I did is unforgivable, except please see that it isn't. You disgust me. You can't begin to imagine how much. You stay out of my room, and you don't speak to me. You don't speak to me generally, and you don't speak to me specifically about your misguided, <laughs> tedious, grubby little publishing plans. What on earth is the matter? She has been in people's bedrooms, going through people's things. I'm put a lock on my door. She? What happened? <laughs> I'd, I'd like to throw this open now to the audience because we don't have very long left. I've tried to condense what is a huge amount of Sally's work down to a sort of potted version. So I hope this has given you a, a flavour of the talented lady in front of me. But let's see if anybody would like to ask some questions. We already have a hand up over there. If we can just get a microphone to you, it'll take two seconds. Thank you for coming. Uh, I have a question about moving into directing and yeah. handling uh, the technical challenges that comes with it in terms of visual style and did mm. you have to study it did you have did, did you acquire experience through your work by watching stuff? how did you manage this well first of all i've been looking that 
I'd, I'd done quite a lot of shows beforehand, so I'd been on the set a lot. So I was very familiar with watching other directors work. Um, I did go on a, a week-long course at the NFTS in Beaconsfield, which the BBC sent me on. And that was chiefly to do with working with actors, which um, was interesting, but uh, it didn't teach me anything about technical things. Um, and, and that was the reason I didn't do it sooner, was the confidence of feeling I didn't know about lenses and that sort of thing. But what you do learn very quickly as a director working on at this level is that you are surrounded by clever people. Um, you know, you, you have to work very closely with your DOP. Uh, I, would, I, would, I would prep all my shot lists for a whole episode before we started shooting any of it. So I would make sure I talked through all those shots with the director. Uh, oh, sorry, with the DOP. And um, DOPs will often come up with their own ideas too, which is always useful to embrace other people's ideas. And, to, you know, just to, to discuss the style as much as you can with... I would discuss it with Nicola Schindler. I would discuss it with the DOP. Uh, and, and to, you know, to embrace lots of other ideas, but also to have a very clear idea of what you want yourself. And um, to watch other people's work who you admire and really take it in. But for me, the... I, th I think the more prep you put in, the more prep, certainly shot lists, I, I really prep those well, well in advance um, because time is so precious when you're filming. Uh, and if you haven't got a plan, you, you really can't do it without a really good plan, I don't think. Um, but, but, sorry, to answer your question, I, I think you just are surrounded by people who want to help you. So, you know, you shouldn't let that stop you making that leap into directing. You will get, you will get surrounded by people and it's up to you just to utilise them. More questions? Just this gentleman here in the black t-shirt. Hi. Um, do you ever have creative blackouts? And if so, how do you get out of them? Creative blackouts? Yeah. Um, I, I don't really um, think writer's block exists. I think that if you can't write the next scene, it's probably because you haven't done quite enough prep. So that does happen to me. Where, and I, I, as I say, I think I am extraordinarily well prepped. But then sometimes you come to write a scene and it just won't be written. And it is almost invariably because you still haven't done quite enough work. And I think it's just a matter of recognising that when, when that's the case. And just going back and looking at the scene and in, in the in the scene breakdown and wondering if you've just not made the right decisions um, and if you should be looking slightly somewhere else for what that scene is about. Um, and I think that's when you can move on. Another question? We have a lady down here. Um, hi, uh, do, you, do you always like, is it always a conscious decision to write characters and things from the north or is it like, do you, is it just a natural thing to write all your characters like, you know, from that's set around Yorkshire and um, Manchester? I, I mean, in the past I've written characters from all over. Uh, it, it, it is a conscious decision actually because I think uh, for me authenticity is important. If something feels real, I think it will engage the audience more. And for me, writing in my own vernacular, writing about the place I grew up in, just makes it feel more real. So I, I hope it will make the audience engage more. I sometimes think I ought to write something. I've, I'm, I've just uh, got the opportunity to write for a show in America. And uh, that's quite scary. Because, uh, you know, it's, I'm, I'm going to have to go and live there and lis listen to people speak. Because, you know, my, otherwise, my only... Um, knowledge of that would be listening to people speaking shows written by other writers. So um, it's about authenticity. So, so, but, so that's why I do consciously write things set in the north. But I hope I could write people from anywhere in. <laughs> Another question? At the back, just right at the back. Do you think that writing strong female fictional characters in professional roles, like in Scott and Bailey, can serve as like, real world role models for women? They're real role models. Is that right? Did you say? Is that what you said? I'm sorry. It's quite so, hard to. I'm sorry. Are they, can they be real world role models, like the professional female characters in fictional? Do you think in 
fictional? In other words, your kind of strong yeah. female characters, do you think that they're the role models of now? I hope so. I mean, I remember feeling influenced and affected by, like, Juliet Bravo and things like that when um, uh, I was younger. I hope so. I hope uh, it would encourage... You make them as realistic as possible. Yeah, you, which is... yeah. I mean, you want your characters yeah. to be exciting, essentially. Uh, you want your characters to be the kind of... You, you, want, you want the audience to want to be those people, I suppose. So I hope they are inspiring. In that is that, have, does that answer your question? Yeah. We have another... There was a uh, hand up at the back there. Uh, yes. Can um, you just... Yeah. In both the uh, clip in Happy Valley and the Scott and Bailey clip, there's great violence against women, both yep. kind of implied and actually shown. Mm. How do you, kind of, as a writer and director, keep that from becoming gratuitous or seeming gratuitous? Um, well, certainly in the Happy Valley one, um, I think it was different from a lot of violence you see against women on TV. A lot of violence against women on TV is usually a dead, naked, very attractive woman. Um, what we did in Happy Valley, where Catherine got beaten up there, the next episode was all about her being in hospital for four weeks and then coming out of hospital and being very depressed. And so I think we were showing the real consequences of violence, which I don't think does happen on TV a lot. A lot of violence on, in film as well is... Men punching each other in the face and then being up and just standing up again and carrying on. And you know, if you've ever witnessed any real violence, we all know that's not what it's like. Real violence is repugnant and you do fall over and you do bleed. Um, so I think we were, we got criticised for that scene, but in some quarters. And I think we actually did it really responsibly by showing the real repercussions and aftermath of that kind of violence. And equally in um, Scott and Bailey, I think, I, I can't remember because that's a long time ago, that's about four years ago mm -hmm. since that epi episode was uh, written and transmitted. But equally, I think, uh, we, look, we look into the backstory of the boy who's committed that and why he's like that. And it's, uh, you know, I don't think it was glamorised at all. It was very down to earth. I mean, one of the big things I learned from Diane Taylor, the detective inspector I worked with, is that most murders aren't... <laughs> It, it's not midsummer murders. It's not middle class posh um, arch villains twirling the moustaches. Most murders are committed by people who are drunk and haven't really thought about what they're doing, uh, or who are off the heads for some other reason. You know, real murder is very squalid, and and um, there's nothing glam glamorous about it at all. And and I wanted to put that across with Scott and Bailey. We have time for two more questions. Hand has shot up here. We have to. So quick. <laughs> um, as like a young writer myself, yeah. um, what would be your advice on getting your idea sort of commissioned or getting someone to pay attention? Um, I the best advice I I can give you is just make a nuisance of yourself. If you if you really believe in your talent. Don't have any inhibitions or shame about putting your, your scripts out there. Um, look, look, watch, when you watch TV or film, look who's produced it, look which company's made it, and write to them and ask them if they will read your script. Um, and just as many as you can, as much as you can, be persistent, knock on doors. Um, I, I'm, I'm quite shy and I'm really not... Um, uh, good at, uh, you know, um, being sharp-elbowed and knocking on doors, but where I never had a problem, because I was confident that what I was writing was good, was sending out scripts to people. I think the very first time I handed a script over to somebody, I was really terrified, and I made her read it while I sat there watching her. <laughs> and after that, I was never inhibited again. I just will, I'll, I'll bore people senseless with my scripts. I'll give them to anyone who wants to know. And I think you've got to have that kind of quite... Um, not ruthless, but just bold attitude. If you believe in your talent, put it out there. The, the best single thing anyone can do as a writer is to get an agent, because most production companies won't read unsolicited scripts. They will only read scripts that come from agents. So again, be 
put yourself out there with agents. Find out who will read new work, who is looking for new work, uh, who deals in TV scripts or whatever you do, and target them, go after them, write to them all. That's, That's a good one. It's a good tip, yeah. And any, any more one question here? Okay. Um, you mentioned earlier about uh, making contacts in university. Yeah. Just wondering, how, what advice would you give to people on how exactly to go about making contacts while you're still in university? Um, again, look at uh, if you, you know if you're interested in TV or film or whatever area you're interested in. Look at who the production companies are. Look who is making the programs. Look for the producer, executive producer credits, and and contact them. Uh, write them, email them. Um, and, and tell them good reasons why y you want to get involved with them. You know, sell yourself. Uh, tell them everything that's good about you and why you're interested and why you, you know, just your passion to want to do the job. You know, what, what, I know it, when, you, when you're starting out, you get a lot of rejections, but what you've always got to remember is that people genuinely are looking for talent. They are looking for new talent. So... Again, if you, have, if you have faith in yourself and your abilities and your uh, whatever it is you're doing, push it. Push it out there. Make sure people get to know what you can do. Be unashamed about it. Be bold. I'm afraid that brings us... Unfortunately, this could have gone much, long, much longer, but I'm afraid that's brought us to the end of this session. Um, thank you, Sally, for giving an insight. <laughs>